Today, we're talking to Marta Kaufman, the incredible creator and writer of the iconic series Friends and Grace and Frankie. Marta is irreverent, funny, vulnerable. In our talk with her, she discusses her insecurities, her creative process, to how she collaborates. We really hope you enjoy today's episode. Marta, we feel like you're part of our uh, women in entertainment family. You've uh, you've been to summits with us, and now I think when we had our first summit, don't I'm aging myself. The podcast didn't even exist, did I don't they? Think they really did. I mean, we've been uh, yeah, we've been doing this for eight or nine years now, and we didn't even have podcasts back in the day. So this is uh, exciting to see the evolution and bring back old friends to uh, to talk on this new format. I'm happy to be here. So we are, um, what we want to talk about today is, um, we kind of want to talk about your whole story. Renee and I were talking before and, um, you know, we didn't know, I didn't know that you, you know, you, you wrote for, you wrote plays and, you know, that was, was that your first love? And so kind of through your project, how your whole career um, evolved, but tell us, tell us about that love. My very first project was um, using my Barbie dolls to put on plays for God. <laughs> I like, wait, for who? For God. My for parents God. were very, for God, because my parents just weren't all that interested in my plays <laughs> with my Barbie dolls. Uh, neither was my dog, God. by the way. <laughs> okay. I thought when I went to college that I wanted to be an actor. Mm. Okay. Um, I, you know, was in plays all through school. I did choreography. I did all this stuff and um, was acting in college and then got the opportunity to first do is direct something with David Crane. We did a, we did Godspell, we co-directed Godspell. And then we decided because there wasn't enough plays and musicals for undergraduates to do. So we decided we'll write one. And I pretty quickly started thinking, huh, I'm on the other side of that table. Um, people aren't staring at me in the same way they stare at you when you're an actor. And I started realizing I liked it better. I was in acting school at the time in okay. New York, yeah. um, but fell in love with writing. And we were in the first few years, we wanted to write a musical. Um, we had a show off Broadway for a while. We did a, we did a um, a USO tour. Oh my God! In oh, Germany wow. and Italy with one of our plays, Personals, which was off Broadway. It was before it went off Broadway, and David and I were in it. So you had both, was, like a writer <laughs> and acting punch on it. Well, we weren't letting our show go to Germany and Italy without us. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much what it came down to. Fair enough. It. Fair enough. <laughs> and it was an incredible experience. It was an incredible experience. So um, then we wrote the musical version of the movie Arthur. And while we're doing all this and not making a living, um, we met Nancy Josephson, who is to this day, this was in 1985. Uh To this day, she is my agent. Oh my gosh. And she said, why aren't you doing television? And we went, I don't know. And she started bringing, making sure we came out to California to meet with people and go on pitches. And, and that's how we got to Dream On, which was that your first, crazy. Yeah. That was our first TV thing. And it was crazy because we were living in New York at the time. Um, they had Universal and John Landis had gone to like a million other writers, all of whom couldn't crack it. So they were scraping the bottom of the barrel talking to a couple of musical theater writers. Mm -hmm. um, And we came up with this way to take all the hours of television they had in a vault and use it in a contemporary series. At the same time, we got a job developing television for Norman Lear. So that that was our move across the country, which I have never ever regretted, not for a Tell moment. Tell us about that. How was working with what Norman that? Lear? That is just, ugh. And that was powers that be, right? That was powers that be. Okay. Um, you know, I, I love Norman. He is a 
brilliant guy. He's done so much good work for the world. He didn't quite get me and David. Okay. He just didn't quite get us. He, he, he at one point literally called us shallow and superficial and when we went off to do Dream On. That's what we had on our office door. It's shallow and superficial <laughs> instead of Marta and David. Um, <laughs> who, was, who was shallow? And <laughs> I think I was shallow. Um, no, he didn't get us. He just yeah. didn't get us. And many, many years later, because he brought in a showrunner to run the show over us and it wasn't quite what we had imagined. Many years later, he and I were doing something for the Producers Guild and he pulled me aside and he said, I made a mistake. Oh, I was going to ask oh, if you're cross, did your paths ever cross again, you know, creatively? Yeah. Not professionally, no, but, okay. but okay. I have only warm, wonderful feelings about him and, um, so appreciated that moment. Right, right. Yeah. So from from those pieces, what what led up to um, you know the big Kahuna of, with of friends? How what were you working on before that? Yeah, it was a combination of things. In Dream On, we had a single male lead, and he had to be in every scene because the thoughts that took us to those old clips were right, his. Right. right. Yeah. That was a lot to put on to someone. Okay. Yeah. We said, next thing we're doing is an ensemble. Okay. That's kind of where we started was what do we want to do as an ensemble show? And we started, oh, just thinking about our days in New York and, and the people we were best friends with. And there were six of us. And we, we started from that point is what was it like when we, you know, moved to New York and we're struggling and looking for love and looking for careers. And um, so it started there. That's interesting. I, I'm, I've just started, um, well, I don't think Friends ever goes away. You just watch it as it always, always, always it's from always the on. beginning. But my daughter's watching it. She's 16 and she loves it. And so watching it with her, it's so interesting how every few episodes your favorite changes because exactly what you're saying there's no one star or there's no one you know person that's that it's all about and i don't think i appreciate i don't think i noted appreciated or noticed it when i watched it around the first time um but it is where where she'll talk about oh Chandler he's my favorite he's so funny he's this and that and then another and you know I liked Rachel's hair even at the beginning you know so she's <laughs> but just appreciate seeing it from a different perspective it really is that everybody is a star it yeah it and and on top of that each one of them was truly a star right yeah did you did you know when you were developing friends that you did you want it to be episodic that people could pick it up and put it down pending the episode or do you prefer more narrative? Well, back then, um, they didn't do that. It was all episodic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You no, know, we had some arcs and we had to fight for some of those. Oh, really? And they were just arcs. Each episode had a you know its own story, its own beginning, middle, and an end. Um, but back yeah. then, we didn't do that kind of continuing storyline yeah. from first episode to the 24th. Yeah. Right. Did you have to fight to get it uh, to have six stars and not be a, was there, was there pushback from the network that like, it can be this, but we need a lead. We need a lead person no. or. Okay. No, not really. I mean, we pitched it as an ensemble comedy. Um, mm -hmm. So it, what it, it, no, they never pushed back on that. The only thing they pushed back on is they wanted an older character who, like, ran the coffee house. Um, okay. So there would be an older character, and, and that we pushed back on and said no. Got Was it. that person going to be, like, the, the mother or the father of the, of the group? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. the advice giver. And... Right, right. Yeah. yeah. That. Okay. In terms of the, you know, TV has changed so much, especially with all of the streamers, you know, finding a, like, as you had just mentioned, like a 22, 24 episode season, it's like, that's a, that's, that's a heavy lift. That's a lot. It's like, do you find that that's, 
do you miss that where you can kind of get all of your ideas out? It's like, there's so much that friends unpacked, right? (laughs) (laughs) Do you find that in terms of, you know, the next projects or the, you know, that you're looking for? Do you like that? Or, you know, you've had obviously a very, very heavy TV career. Are you looking at something like a film or? Well, first of all, I think 13 episodes is perfect. Okay. Okay. I think that's the perfect number of episodes. Um, you know, 24 episodes, when you go from season to season, there's no real break. Yeah. It's like, are those breaks um, like what, one or, one or two months between filming? Not even. Not oh, even. Wow. You would finish in May. We would still have to do editing. Uh-huh. Um, and then we would start back in July. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, because to get ready for September, that was, I mean, yeah. I can remember being young and I, if you, I'm probably aging myself, but that week, that second, first or second week in September when everything premiered yeah. and everything new come, came back and, and then went until you didn't get a replay or a rerun until the summer. You know, if you missed right. it, you missed it and you couldn't catch up till July. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but that was, um, yeah, that is, that is interesting. Do you, um, what about, I mean, obviously, I, you know, we want to talk about Grace and Frankie, and there's there's so much there. We you know what, before we get to that, before okay. we get to that, I wanted to finish answering your question. Okay. Because um, I am starting to dip my toe in film. Here's the thing about doing film versus doing television. Um, doing television is like a marriage. Yeah. Goes on for a long time. Characters grow and change. The the show begins to tell you things. Doing a movie is more like a first date, perhaps the only date. (laughs) Um, So for me to want to do a film, I had to find the project that really, really spoke to me. Yeah. Um, And that had me feeling like I have to make this film. Yeah. Are you writing uh, uh, writing it or is it someone else's? Yes, it's written. Oh, okay. And are where are, what stage are we in? Are you in, are you starting production or not yet? No, 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 we're, we're trying to sell it now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I wrote it on spec. Oh, wow. That's exciting. That's how much I believe in it. That's incredible. Are you, you know, in terms of the process, how did you get into the, it's like, obviously I'm, I'm not a writer clearly, Mm -hmm. but in terms of how you transitioned from, from writing television to film, was, were there challenges for you, you know, since it it is a, a first date, so to say? (laughs) Honestly, the, it's based on a book. Okay. Um, and the book is so good and so instructor, structured in such an unusual way. Um, I felt like the job was not being able to write a movie versus being able to write TV as much as how do I honor this book and tell okay. this story in two hours or less. Um, Did you go back and forth? I, to I see? think it's going to be, I'm sorry. I was going to say, did you go back and forth to whether it should be more of a series or a show or a movie? Did that, was that a challenge? We, we started thinking maybe it was a limited series. Mm-hmm. Um, but then in, in working at it in that format, began to realize it's really a feature film. Do you feel like writers have more freedom because there's a series is the norm, a limited series is the norm, a movies that are like, there's all of those things are there, they're out there and they exist. So as you're looking at a project, you have more places where it can fit naturally versus, you know, back in the day when it was like, it's either a movie or a TV show, there's nothing else. Is there, is there more opportunity for good stories to fit in the, in the right um, space? Well, there is theoretically. Theoretically, there's, there's, it, it, it's a more organic process of deciding where something belongs. But the question remains, um, 
who's going to make it? I mean, beside the yeah. strike aside, right, right now right. it's very hard to sell something. Next to impossible. And it's also next to impossible to keep something on the air. So right now, nobody's feeling particularly optimistic about selling anything. And Beyond that's even- strike, what do you think is driving that? Um, I, I think it's much of the same stuff that's driving the strike. I mean, the streamers yeah. don't want to have more than a couple of, or three seasons of something. Um, uh, they're not buying as much. Um, they're buying much shorter orders. Yeah. You know, a six episode order is not really a series. Right. No. So it's, um, it's pretty hard to call it that. Yeah. And it's all about money. It's all about how much money can yeah. I make? Yeah. And save. Right, right. Do you think that it's, um, as a, as a creative, is it helpful or, or hurtful that, you know, that they're all of the streamers and that they're all trying to produce their own, you know, they want to produce and own their own content versus going out and buying and, and doing, does it give more opportunity or, or less because they're just focusing on their own, their own. It, it, I projects. think it gives less opportunity, but it also, I think limits their thinking. You know, one of the streamers or one of the companies says, here's the kind of stuff we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And you can't then have an outside person come in and say, I have an idea. And this could be, I know this is radical, but it could be a really good idea. And they go, no, no, we're not doing shows about for people in their 30s. We're just not. That's right. not our audience. So there's, there are all these rules that have come into place. And if you don't fit into them, yeah. then you don't sell. And I think even beyond that, um, creatively, it limits what the audience gets to see. Is that like, in terms of, you know, Grace and Frankie, you know, it's been such an amazing hit and it's been a hyper successful show. You know, what was that pitch process like? And obviously that was, you, you pitched a couple of years ago, but you've had a successful multi-season run on that. Yeah, but it was way before all this crap started happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we had it... seven seasons. They don't do that anymore. It's crazy. They just don't. And they did back then. I was, say, was it a challenge because of the, 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 the genre, the age of the audience and the, and the actors? I mean, obviously, they're the best of the best. Honestly, no. I mean, you know, we wanted to sell this. We had Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin. We knew somebody was going to buy it, if not right, you know, right. multiple people. And we had the Netflix that we were at um, really encourage us, encouraged us to stay true to our vision, mm. not their vision of it, ours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They don't do that anymore either. They know you to death now. What kind it's all, of... And it's all about it becoming corporate. Yeah. 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 Everything's very cookie cutter and puts through the process. Yeah. God, so, I mean, we're just so god awful. I mean, it's just... <laughs> you just see the same thing, the same story, the same story so many times. Yeah. What was... Um, the initial fee, the initial response to to Grace and Frankie was, did you, I mean, was it a whole new audience that was just so happy to be represented on screen and in such a real way, such a fun way? You know, yes. The, the true surprise was that it wasn't just that audience. Mm -hmm. We assumed that the audience we would have for it would be women of a certain age and it went far beyond that mm -hmm. um and and the thing that i loved is that mothers and daughters were watching together and then the daughters were taking it to their friends and then their friends were watching it with their mothers there was something really lovely about that um yes women of women of that age reached out to us a lot to say um that they hadn't seen themselves portrayed on tv before and they were grateful for the honesty mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, um, in terms of what it's like to be that age. Um, but it was exciting more than challenging. 
in terms of, you know, coming, going, just kind of like, you know, you've had two massive hits. It's like, did you know Friends was going to be what it was going to be? And then what did you take from Friends that you took into Grace and Frankie? I knew nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I knew nothing. I, I mean, that's not why you do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You put on a show that you're proud of, that you hope people will watch. Yeah. At least I never dreamed of the massive hit. I just wanted to be working. In terms of Grace and Frankie, what I took from there, from Friends, was who I am as a writer um, and what speaks to me as a writer. And I sort of was able to go, all right, this, this, is, this was some of my part of Friends. This is um, the same stuff that I can take and use over here. Yeah. You know, I, I'll never do a Veep. That's just not me. I'll never do a show like that. And, okay. and God bless them for doing it, but I wouldn't be able to. Um, my shows tend to be a little cozier. <laughs> yeah. Fair to say. Mm -hmm. In terms of your creative process, you know, one, I can't imagine being as funny as the stuff that you've written <laughs> in general. Can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? I'm not that funny. <laughs> I'm really not. I don't, know, I don't know if I believe you on that one. <laughs> yeah. It has to come from somewhere. It's like some of the one liners um, were, are amazing. Um, you know, what is your creative process like, or what was your and David's creative process like? You know, I know in our 2018 summit, you talked a lot about collaboration and, and what that process was like. You know, what, what was that? What was that like for you, you know, on both shows or transitioning as well as some of your other projects? You know, writing with David, the process was we wrote almost every word together. Hmm. He was generally at the keyboard. Um, I felt like I wrote out loud because we were always in conversation about it. And then when I went, David and I decided we, we just wanted different things. We're still very close and I love him to bits. Um, I just, when I had to write alone I was like, wait a minute, how do I do this? How do I do the thing with the typing and thinking all at the same time? <laughs> um, and there were two things I had to do. One was embrace that I used to write out loud and I had to have conversations with myself, like writing, is this a stupid idea? And then answering that. <laughs> um, but the other thing I had to learn was my rhythm as a writer. Oh, interesting. I ride waves. I'll sit down, I'll start, I'll gear up, and I'll ride the wave until I sort of, until it crashes. Very often it's at the end of a scene, sometimes it isn't. And then I sort of readjust, I remind myself what the next scene is about, I get up and I do other stuff. Hmm until something will occur to me. I'll go, oh my God, that's the way into that scene. And then I ride the next wave. And it takes longer mm -hmm. than what other people do where they can just sit down and yeah. have a facility and a, a, a speed that they can do their work with. Um, it can take me all day, all weekend, all week, you know. But it works for me. That's what's it works for me. I, I always admire the people who sit down and say, I'm going to write, you know, 10,000 words between 2 and 4 p.m. Uh, that's <laughs> great for them. Um, <laughs> that sounds terrible. Yeah. That sounds, <laughs> that's very, that's job, like, that's that's very job like. <laughs> like, even, yeah. I'm curious about your. Um, your team, and as you were talking about the movie and, you know, writing, are there the do you do you bring the same team along with you and will you for a feature and what you know do you want to play other roles in in projects how do you um, how do you I have fit a yourself company. in 
I have a company. Um, we're called OK Good Night. Um, we did Grace and Frankie together. Um, we did our Gloria All Red documentary, Seeing All Red. We did that together. Um, we're doing our current development together. We're working on a couple other documentaries, and we're doing the film together. It's okay. a company of all women. Uh, oh, kick-ass, nice. smart women. Um, and we all, our tastes are very much aligned. And I love this company. And in terms of spreading my wings, I did some directing on Grace and Frankie, and I loved it. I loved it. And I would like to do more. I mean, I'm a writer. I will always be a writer. I'm a showrunner. Yeah. I will always be a showrunner. I really enjoyed directing. Oh, that's great. It's actually one of my questions for you was around OK Good Night of what that was like, just because I think for you, you know, going in and owning your own company, is, it, it's, it's a feat and job in and of itself. So, you know, did you have a transition in terms of how you wanted that to come together? What was your vision behind it? You know, and, and how did you bring that team together? The vision behind it, behind it is that I wanted to have a company of women who would have each other's backs. Um, who understood that sometimes children get in the way of your work, and that's okay, and who are passionate and have strong work ethics, and mm -hmm. who ethically is aligned with me. Um, I had been on a, a board of trustees for the school my kids went to, and I met Robbie Tolan, my producing partner. We did a bunch of huge fundraisers, fundraisers with, with, I mean, our casts were ridiculous. Steve Carell and Nancy <laughs> Carell and Jason Alexander. I mean, crazy shows. We did musicals. And, and then we did these five short films together because we enjoyed working together. And we finally said, you know what? Let's get paid to do something together. And that's <laughs> when we did. <laughs> decided we would do this. Um, full disclosure, our VP is a woman named Hannah Cantor, and she's my daughter. And we started working together a little bit before Grace and Frankie, worked together all through Grace and Frankie, wrote that film together, wrote another um, script together, two more scripts together. And it has been like the best thing. It's been the oh, best thing oh ever. We don't fight. Oh um, we don't. We don't fight. That's she can get a what little it, stubborn, as I pro she would probably say I can too. But I, I <laughs> think after having a partner for so long at saying, let's put a pin in that and come back to it. And then you never have to get into anything heated. Okay. What a then to get to work the with woman who was my <laughs> the woman who was my assistant is now our creative executive, and then we have one or other woman who's my assistant and, and she's the coordinator for the company. Okay. Did you find it? You know, as projects are coming to you, you know, under under Okay Good Night, are you? what kind of projects are you looking to continue to produce and, and, and get involved in, you know, what are, you what may be really surprised. You? you may be surprised. We're looking at everything from a multi-camera, fully improvised sitcom. Wow. Be a lot. It's a <laughs> lot, right? Is that what you're referring to? To science yeah. fiction. All the way oh, to science wow. fiction. Yeah. We okay. are, Surprisingly, all of us love science fiction in my company, so we're hell bent on doing an all woman science fiction show. Oh, very cool. There is a huge audience for that, I would say, out of all of my friends, like the, from a reading perspective, we all read science fiction. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot <laughs> all right, of people. Hi, I've got a great one for you. I have the best one ever. Which one? The Sparrow. The Sparrow. You know, that's on our book list. I, one of my best friends just read it and she's loved it. Read it. It's so good. We've started uh, Women in Entertainment. We've started branching out. We have a little um, 
little site and a little called the Book Nook. And it's amazing. I mean, I don't, I'm not surprised that creatives are, are all avid readers, but we have found on our podcast, sometimes we'll get into, we'll talk about books more than we'll talk about projects and what people are working on because it is, uh, especially in the summer, I guess, it's so, yeah. there, it's such a luxury and such a, uh, a treat to, to get to read books and share them with, uh, with everybody. I love to, when I'm traveling and I'm reading a book, you know, usually flying or whatever. If I finish my book, my new thing is I leave it in the hotel room with a note for the housekeeping, like share this book with someone. It was, you know, and I'll write my little reviews. So I've been trying to finish them and leave them as, I I, as I've been traveling. That's great. But science fiction is, uh, that, that would be, uh, that would be yeah. a fun, a fun, a fun stretch. Um, the, the series, the five series that you mentioned doing, will you tell us a little bit about how that, how that came about and how, you know, the, the topics and the docs and the mental health and the women's issues, how, how did that come about as, as something that you wanted to be involved in or wanted to, to work on? You know, the first of the five, the two, five projects we did was about, um, breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And... I wish I could tell you I remember exactly how this all started, and I don't. I just know that we got a small room of writers together and came up with five short films about breast cancer, each of them very different mm -hmm. from the previous one. Um, and, it was, and we hired all women to direct, um, some of them first-time directors. Mm -hmm. um, and then we wanted with, I think it was with Lifetime, we wanted to do another series of these and do it on mental health, which is quite a broad topic. So each film was about a different aspect of a mental health issue um, or a different mental health issue. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we used women directors um, Robbie Tolan did not actually work with me on that one. I was, that was before the Robbie days. In terms of, you know, obviously you're talking a lot about just supporting women, women led stories. Do you find that there's a shift in attitude or expectations of women entering the industry or, you know, especially, you know, especially over the course of the past few years? Um, obviously Holly was kind of gone through some transformations, but do you find that there is a shift towards it in terms of, you know, how women are approaching projects, you know, openness to hiring women or, and women-led stories holistically? What I see more than anything is that there are kick-ass women, trans, non-binary showrunners who are helping pave the way um, there are a lot more showrunners now than when I started. I'm part of a, a coalition of showrunners um, who are trying to make the studios accountable for crew members and actors and PAs who have uteruses who are working on our productions in abortion hostile states. How are we going to protect those women? And I've met the most incredible group of women through this. You know, as showrunners, we are siloed from each other to a large extent. You know, we all run our own shows and we don't see each other and our paths rarely cross except for maybe at a party. And we have had the opportunity to work together on this, to be part of something, to share a passion, to share our grief. Uh, and I know this isn't exactly answering your question, but I found it really hopeful. That's nice. Yeah. Um, in terms of the business, look, there's still misogyny. There is. There is. And I think what's important is that we have more and more people who are saying, I will not put up with that. So yeah. I, I, I think, you know, also with every kind of diversity, the conversation is further along than it was even five years ago. 
So because you're just you're, you've you've mentioned a few times just like first time directors and how do you support you know women in multiple roles, you know, and I think right. one of our one of the things about our audience is a lot of them are up and coming creatives, right? And 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 what they're what they're asking for and what we have found even through the summits, what we find through the podcast is. They, their questions have a lot to do with how do you push through the fear? Like, what was that first day like? How do you calm your, like, stomach of not throwing up on set? Or, like, <laughs> like, all of those different things. So, you know, I, I in I terms of, I know the like, answer to that question. Well, I was going to say, can you channel me back to some of your first times on set and, and some of the experiences you've had? It's all about do, do, do. Don't think, do. <laughs> Yeah. You get on set, you know exactly what you have to do. You prepare if you're prepared. If you're not prepared, good luck. But if you're prepared, <laughs> you come on set. You know what the staging is going to be. Um, you've looked at the props. You've looked at the thing. You know where they go. So you can come in and act. You know, you can act yeah. on something. So you don't have to be like, oh, my God, oh, my God, all these people are looking at me. My, my daughter is an equestrian. She's a professional equestrian. And she was a little girl. She was invited to be in a clinic with a, the coach of the U.S. equestrian team. And I've never seen her nervous before. And she was crying terrified. Oh, oh gosh. She got on the horse. She started going around. She was great. She was great. Yeah. And afterwards, I said to her, you looked so calm when did it change for you? And she said, the minute I started trotting. And that's because she did something and she did something she understands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel mm -hmm. like it's the same thing with directing. Have your plan, know what you're going to do, be open to change, but start doing right away. Yeah. Don't wait for someone to, else to tell you. Right, that it's okay. When you're looking at, you know, your, your up and coming projects and so forth, what do you, what, what do you still fear? Like what are, what's intimidating to you still through the process? You know, you've... Um, everything. Really? Really? Oh yeah. Will it get made? Am I good enough? Oh my gosh. Um, am I Am I really a writer? I mean, all those fears that you have when you start, they don't they go away. Yeah. You, you get a certain confidence in things that you know you can do, but the things you've always been insecure about, you're still insecure about. And yeah. especially right now with the business being what it is. And, you know, there was a period that we just couldn't sell anything. And it was like, is it us? Is it yeah. what we're choosing or is it the business? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and at this point in my career, I still have to look at what I'm doing and saying, is it me or is it them? Interesting. That, is interesting. that vulnerability is still there. Oh yeah. Marta, what are you, um, what are you watching? By the way, wait, before, let me just say yeah. that vulnerability, it's an asset. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was, I was going to, I was going to ask you, you know, in terms of friends, you said, you know, you wrote that taught thinking about your twenties and living in New York and, and so forth, you know, and then you have Grace and Frankie and, and some of the characters that you've had, all of the females that you've written, they all resonate with so many different women, you know, their, their personality traits that we all face. Are we getting married? Are we going to have a baby or, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's so much, right? So you know, when you're looking at your next projects that you're writing, obviously you have this film project you're selling, you know, do you still put you into all of these different projects, you know, and is, are you writing what you're fe feeling vulnerable about? Or are you looking at things that like you might've, that might've passed, you know, you're into that next chapter so you can reflect on them differently and write them differently. You know. For the most part, what attracts me to a project is the need for me to tell the story. The need to tell the story and then the need yeah. for me to do it. And I don't then look at it and go, oh, I can't write science fiction. Um, I look at it with my basic insecure eyes and say, can I write? But beyond that, I, I realize it's just another version of storytelling, like like documentaries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I walked into it going, I don't know what I'm doing, then realize, wait a minute. 
I'm telling a story. It's just another form. Yeah. Um, and I think that's true if you're doing a half hour or if you're doing an hour science fiction, a half hour comedy or an hour science fiction. You're telling a story. Um, nothing that I write is going to be only serious. Mm -hmm. You know, I won't write the act. I will watch it to death, but I won't, I can't write that. Everything I do has some laughs. I don't so know how are, to write that. <laughs> <laughs> you are funny. <laughs> it's interesting. It's like, and, and one of the things that we're so thankful for is when, you know, people come onto the podcast because uh, I'll be frank, I met you about 10 years ago. Um, I was doing, I was brought in to do communications because I read, I have a PR boutique, but 10 years ago I was working, I was brought in to substitute in at Skydance for communications. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was. Uh, oh, wow. I, I worked with Ann Globe and Shannon over at DreamWorks. And when Shannon was pregnant, they asked me to come in to, to do the communications while she was out on maternity. And, and I remember meeting you and I was so intimidated being like, she has it completely together. And, you know, like this is like Marta Kaufman, you know, and it's just, it's so refreshing to hear that, you know, those vulnerabilities and, you know, and everything that you put into the work and the film and the content that you do, um, you know, that, that there's, that everybody's vulnerable, right? And that's part of why we're doing the podcast is to kind of take some of that intimidation out um, that people can create in their heads. And I remember younger Renee being very intimidated at like the Skydance Christmas party, <laughs> you know, and all of that of, you know, just watching the world around me, not necessarily engaging it. And then, you know, and for someone in communications, I don't know what that says, but... <laughs> but <laughs> But do you know what I mean? It's just, it's been, um, it's been an absolute pleasure to like, to hear your story and, you know, for you to open up to our audiences this way. We really appreciate that. I'm so hopeful so to that. Yeah, they, it helps so much. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, and, you know, we hope that you, you come back and speak at our summit, you know, and your project gets picked up and we can do promotion for you. Yes. And oh, I can't wait. We I'm excited. Can, you, can about... you tell us what book it is? Yes. It is a book called We Are All Completely Beside Ourselves. We're going to get it today. I, I, cannot, I have read that book now four times. Really? Okay. I love that book. It, it is up there in my top five favorite books. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. when, did you, when did you first find that? When did you first find the book? Right after it came out, was it like 15 years ago, maybe 12 years ago? Okay. Okay. Oh, it was so fun, Marta. Thank you. You're uh, uh, reaching new audiences all the time. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you for such interesting questions. I really appreciate they weren't the, uh, the normal ones. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe and leave a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. To stay up to date with In Her Words, join the conversation by following Women in Entertainment on our social channels and subscribe to our weekly newsletter at womeninentertainment.com.